Welcome to our second LaTeX tutorial on formatting mathematical notation. During this tutorial, we'll spend time learning about different mathematics modes that we can set up in our LaTeX document that allow us to take advantage of specific LaTeX markup syntax for creating formatted mathematical notation so that you can have well-formatted expressions and equations in your formatted document. We'll spend a little bit of time as well learning what that notation is, what that mathematical mar markup notation is, by just taking a survey of some of the possibilities that are there. And then finally, we'll learn how to create some of our own customizable theorem and theorem-like environments as part of the AMS LaTeX package. As we've established, LaTeX is a markup language for formatting text. This means that the style elements of a document are controlled by special syntax. It's the markup. Formatting mathematical notation in your document works in the same way. There are commands for rendering mathematical symbols and structures. Additionally, mathematical notation can only be rendered inside of a special mathematics environment known as mathematics mode. There's several ways to instantiate a mathematics mode, so we'll look at each one separately. The simplest mathematics mode in LaTeX is inline mode. This allows you to embed mathematical notation right in the middle of a line of ordinary text. Inline mathematics mode is delimited by an opening and closing pair of dollar sign symbols. For example, this following line of markup, this is inline math dollar sign 3 carat 2 plus 4 carat 2 equals 5 carat 2 dollar sign appearing within text period would be rendered as mathematical notation right in the middle of a line of text where it appears. It would look something like what we see below in a formatted document. And we can see that that mathematical notation inside of the dollar signs with the, the carats and the other mathematical operators becomes a well-formatted instance of actually the Pythagorean theorem. Often you'll want to format mathematical expressions on their own line instead of embedding them within a line of existing text. There's a few approaches that you can follow to accomplish this. Unnumbered equations can be wrapped inside of the slash square bracket and slash closing square bracket symbols. Alternatively, and really equivalently, the begin display math and end display math delimiters can be used to create a so-called display math environment, and it works the same way. It's more explicit, but it's otherwise equivalent. And so if we took the same mark markup from the previous example, 3 carat 2 plus 4 carat 2 equals 5 carat 2, and embedded it in between those delimiters, we'd get the same expression formatted in our document, much like what we see below here, but it would appear centered on its own line within the document, and it causes it to stand out more. That's an unnumbered equation. There's numbered equations as well, and those are going to be wrapped inside of the begin equation and end equation environment. Numbered equations have their own numerical counters, and they can be labeled and referenced using the slash label and slash reference commands that we have already experimented with when we were working with numbered sections. So the following is a rendered example, and we can see the mathematics looks the same. It's just that there's a, uh, an equation number that appears towards the margin of the document. In this case, it's equation one. There are additional mathematics modes that we can take advantage of beyond just the inline mode and the standalone display math mode. One popular alternative that's often used when you're working with groups of equations is a multi-line math mode. And there are a few options, but the one that we'll introduce here is created using the align environment. So it's delimited by the begin align and end align syntax. You could also use begin align asterisks and end align asterisks if you wanted an unnumbered version. And align allows you to stack one equation on top of another, and it becomes those equations become aligned along a character that you choose. 
And we'll see how to do that in an example below. But in this rendered example that we're looking at, we can see that we've got these three linear equations and they are all aligned by their equal signs. You can also see that every equation in this group has its own line number. It was automatically generated, so they've got their own counters. And those can be individually labeled and then later on referenced if you choose to. And as I've said, if you don't want line numbers on any of them, then you can use the align asterisk environment instead. One other option that's worth knowing about, and we'll, we'll experiment with this a little bit in our example that's coming up, is that you can suppress line numbering in an align number in a, in a uh, align environment by issuing a slash no number command before the end of the line that you want to suppress the numbering on. So we'll see how to do that too. So here's our example, the mathmodes.tech document that we've set up as an example. Broaden the margin a little bit, the page width. And this is just going to be a brief document that shows us how to set up the different math modes that we've just surveyed, the inline math mode, the display math, math mode, and then the multi-line math mode that we created using a, an align environment. So as we scroll through this document, it looks like an ordinary LaTeX document like the ones that we've created before. It begins with a document class statement. I've loaded a few uh, packages. Mostly I've just loaded the AMS packages, AMS Math, AMS Sim, and AMS Theorem because we'll use those to access some mathematical markup and then later on uh, a theorem-like environment. I've given it a title, an author, a date, and I've skipped an abstract in this document just because we're really focusing on demonstrating mathematics and nothing other beyond that. So as we scroll through, we can see that there's some examples of mathematics that's being created in an inline mode. Right here, we've got the um, we've got the Pythagorean trig identity: cos squared of x plus sine squared of x equals one. Now, in this example, I am just going to make use of some selected um, mathematical markup syntax without really explaining it too much because in a little while we'll spend some time going through some online documentation where you can see lots of different examples of how the different types of mathematical markup syntax works. Um, so in this case, you know, we'll see that there's markup for a cosine function and it's slash cosine. We're using um, the, the caret symbol to get a, an exponent of power. Uh, but all of that is, is mathematical notation, and it does need to appear inside of math mode. In fact, if you forget and you use some mathematical syntax, your LaTeX compiler will probably, if, if you use that syntax outside of a math mode, your LaTeX compiler will probably throw an error in which it complains and says that it, it's detected a missing dollar sign and it's tried to insert it to fix the issue. It usually will not fix anything and you've got to go back and figure out where you forgot to create a math mode and, and do some debugging on your own. So you can see that there's a few different examples where I've created inline math modes, and, and I'm trying to demonstrate some situations where um, there's some pitfalls with using inline math load. I tend to keep my inline expressions pretty short and simple. If they get long and complex, one of the problems that you can run into is that they, they will break across a line, and I, it's okay, but I personally don't like that. Another issue is sometimes you'll have mathematical expressions like fractions that will not be able to be broken. Like if you've got a very long numerator and a very long denominator in a fraction, that's something that can't be conveniently broken across from one line of text to, to the next. And so then that extends into the margin. And that when your LaTeX document compiles, that'll actually give you a warning, not an error, but a warning that says your document is not as good as it could possibly be. And you'll find that you see you have a little bit of text poking out into the margin of your document. So we can see what those two pieces of markup look like. I make a little bit more room for my, my document here temporarily. Now we'll just do 100%. And 
you know, we can see here's that Pythagorean trig identity, and it looks fine. It appears in line on our line of text. But when I had this longer quadratic polynomial, or I guess it's a cubic polynomial, see how it splits from one line to the next. That might, might be fine for some people, but I don't, I don't love it. We can see with these other inline expressions that we've used, I, I tend not to like what's happening here because they're examples of two-dimensional mathematical notation. It's stuff that reads not just left to right, but up and down, like a continued fraction or a summation symbol with, with um, limits and maybe a fraction inside of the, uh, the, the sum. Same problem with, with integrals with limits. These things take up additional vertical space, and that causes LaTeX to have to adjust the spacing between lines of text. And it leaves these gaps, which I think are kind of ugly. They're, they're not, not my favorite thing to see. So if I've got mathematical expressions like these, I tend to try to put them into display math mode. I give them uh, their own line to be rendered on so that they don't mess with the line spacing of my text. So we'll move on and see how that works in the next section here. And I typically create my display math environments if I want an unnumbered equation with the slash square bracket and slash closing square bracket. But you could, as I said in the overview, use the display math environment as well. And those will both be equivalent. And in fact, in these two examples here, I've used the, both environments to render the same expression. And we'll see that, you know, they look basically identical. These logistic differential equations, they, you know, they, they look the same. So the slash square bracket and slash closing square bracket and begin and end display math are largely equivalent for uh, rendering purposes. Now, if I wanted a numbered equation, you can see that we've got one down here. The way I created it was to use the equation environment. You can see that right here. Begin equation and end equation, and it's wrapped around some mathematical syntax. And the important thing to remember is that since it's a numbered environment, it has a counter attached to it, so you can give it a label, and I did. I gave it a label, uh, I, the label tag or the name was eq colon transcendental continuing with my naming convention for labeled items they need to i like to describe both the type of item an equation in this case with eq and then the topic of it it's a transcendental equation and we can see that i've already referred to it in the text as well with the reference command so you can reference to labeled equations in LaTeX if you want to, and it will keep track of synchronizing those equation numbers, uh, both in your text where you reference it and on the line number for the equation so that you don't have to. And as we saw over here, it you know looks good. Equation one, the equation number is one. So it, it gets rendered well. Well, our final example is using the align environment so that we can render this multi-line example of a system of three linear equations. So I've opened it and closed it with the align environment. How do I align given, how do I align each equation by each of their equal signs? Well, in these gridded environments like align, and we'll see that there's others, you use what's called an alignment tab or an alignment character, and that's the ampersand symbol. So when I put that ampersand in before the equal sign on each of the three equations inside of a line, this one, this one, and this one, then what that does is it gives LaTeX the instruction to stack those equations so that their equal signs are right on top of each other, aligned vertically. I tell LaTeX that I'm at the end of an equation by giving it the, the hard return symbol, the double slash symbol. And then I'm suppressing equation numbering in the align environment using the no number symbol on the first and third line. I've tried to give a label to the second equation 
numbered linear system, or the label is EQ numbered linear system. And I, I do try to refer to it uh, previously in the document. So let's compile that and see how that all looks. And I'm going to compile it twice just to make sure that I'm synchronizing all of my labels correctly. And let's blow this up a little bit. We can see that that middle equation is labeled with a 2. It's referred to by equation 2. And it all looks fine. Now, if I didn't want to have any of those lines in the align environment numbered, I could have gone back and just changed everything to the align asterisk environment. And then I should get rid of no number, my label, my other no number. And I should just get rid of my reference because that, that equation is no longer there. So I'd maybe say that these features are demonstrated in the equations below, period. So if I rerun that, run it a couple of times and re-render the picture, see that all my line numbers are gone and my labels and references are gone as well. So that's, that's how the three basic math modes within LaTeX work. The inline mode delimited by dollar signs, the standalone or the display math mode delimited by slash bracket slash closing bracket, the square brackets, or uh, begin and end display math. And then finally, the align environment for these, these um, stacked systems of equations. Now, there is quite a bit more flexibility that you can take advantage of with the align environment and then some some relatives of it there's there's more than one um more than one environment that you can use in, in latex for um, creating groups of equations and those appear in well there's more information about those that appear in an online reference that we'll actually take um, and, and make a lot of use out of in this series of tutorials in fact, we're going to move to those online references or on, move to that online reference next. Um, and it's, it's, it's called the LaTeX Wikibook. But what we're interested in today is chapter four on technical text and in particular, section one of chapter four on mathematics. And we'll spend a little bit of time looking at the advanced mathematics chapter as well. So this chapter begins with what we've already seen how to set up the different mathematics environments, whether they're inline or display mode or even multi-line mode. We'll skip over that. We'll see that that's mostly review for what we've already seen. What we're interested in seeing now is how do we, how do we actually create the mathematical expressions that we want to have rendered in our document? And first thing to be aware of is that you know, LaTeX is aware of a pretty large set of symbols. Now there's a set of symbols right there on the calc or on the keyboard that you can take advantage of to represent the basic arithmetic operators. Things like addition, subtraction, equals, factorial symbols, division, and then different types of parentheses and uh, for grouping or operators like the less than or greater than symbols and so on. But there's many more. Um, down in um, the end of this page, and there's a useful link that we can click on to get to it. There's a comprehensive LaTeX symbol list. And here's what it looks like, list of mathematical symbols. And it's just at the bottom of our document. But we can see that there is all kinds of mathematical markup for different types of comparison operators, they all tend to begin, unless it's a keyboard symbol, they all tend to begin with a flash symbol indicating that we're, you know, we're working with a LaTeX or a LaTeX command. There's binary operators for different types of arithmetic. So we can see things, usual things like the plus or minus or the minus plus symbols or multiplication and division symbols but others that are maybe a little bit less familiar and, and might become more familiar depending on the path that you take in 
mathematics and you'll use them if that's the case and you won't otherwise. Um, some set and logic notation that's all available in, in, in LaTeX. Uh, delimiters and grouping symbols, things like different types of brackets and arrows. Lots of different um, alphabets. So in math, you'll often use the Greek alphabet to describe your variables. So all of the Greek letters from the Greek al alphabet can be rendered. Um, again, they're using using markup language, slash alpha for alpha, slash beta for beta. And there, if when there are capitalized and lowercase versions, then you just spell uh, these words out with the first little letter capitalized if you want a capital letter. And then you can scroll along and see that there's other symbols, different types of operators, and so on. So this is a pretty full list that you can take advantage of. And just to remember it, it's, it's at the bottom of our uh, LaTeX or our LaTeX mathematics chapter. Well, you've already seen when I represented a couple of different examples of the Pythagorean theorem that I was able to add exponents onto different numerical values and variables as well. Exponents are created with the caret operator. This is the symbol above the six on your keyboard. And there's a couple of things you need to know about it. First of all, it, it only works inside of math mode. So you must encapsulate it inside of some dollar signs or a display math mode or perhaps a, an align environment. Otherwise, you'll get an error. The other thing to be aware of about the caret operator is that it will only take the first character to the right of it and put it into an exponent or power position. If you wanted a power or an exponent that's more than two characters long, then you need to encapsulate that exponent inside of curly braces if we did down here on end of the 22nd power. If you don't, if we left those curly braces out, this would be rendered as n squared and then with a 2 down on the, the main baseline of your text. And it would look wrong. Now, the same is true for subscripts. The subscript operator is the underscore. And you get to an underscore by hitting the shift minus key. And it works the same way if you want more than one character in the subscript, then encapsulate your subscript inside of curly braces. It's possible to render fractions and binomial expressions in LaTeX with the frac command and the binome command. They take two operators, the numerator and the, or two inputs, the numerator and the denominator inside of curly braces. Or in the case of the binomial, it's the size of the group that you're choosing from and the size of the group that you're choosing are the two inputs. Roots are possible structures to take advantage of. So you've got square root symbols that you can render with the square root function, slash SQRT. It takes a single input, and whatever you feed into the curly braces is going to be what appears under the square root symbol. Now, if you give it an optional input argument inside of square brackets, then that character or characters that's inside of the square brackets will become the, the um, order of the root. So if you wanted to compute the nth root of something, you would render that with a n inside of the square brackets. If you've worked with some calculus and encountered sums and integrals, those can be rendered as well using the slash sum and the slash int command. Those, ex th those typically have limits, lower and upper limits, and those are just created using the subscript and superscript operators, the underscore and the caret operators. There are other big operators like um, um, continued sums, continued unions, products, uh, intersections and continued intersections, various tensor notations like the wedge operators, multiple integrals, and so on. If you find yourself in need of using them, those are the big style operators that are available as well. LaTeX rec recognizes a pretty broad range of brackets and braces and other delimiters. So you can use parentheses, square brackets, curly braces for grouping. One thing to be aware of, though, is that since the um, 
curly brace is, is typically reserved in LaTeX as a um, symbol for, for containing the input of a, of, of, a, of a LaTeX function. If you actually want to render that curly brace as a symbol, you need to put a slash in front of it, like we see around the C here. If you forget that, it's just going to get ignored and it'll it'll be as if it doesn't when you look at your formatted document it'll look as if it wasn't even there the braces that you contain mathematical expressions inside of a lot of times if you've got a two-dimensional mathematical expression that's got some height to it if you just wrap that in ordinary braces it's going to look funny the braces are going to be small and it's, it's like we see with this fraction here if i didn't do something special then that fraction is going to be taller than the parentheses that get rendered so the way to size the height of those parentheses automatically instead of just wrapping parentheses around that fraction operator you're going to let wrap a left parenthesis and a right parenthesis and those can be mismatched. I could do a left parenthesis with a right bracket, do a left curly brace with a right curly with a right round parenthesis. What I can't do is open one of these automatically sized parentheses and then fail to close it. In fact, if I want to open one and have it rendered looking like it's not closed on that line, then I need to use an invisible parenthesis, which is rendered with slash left period. We can see an example of that where we've got something with a vertical bar that's we've got a fraction here with a vertical bar that is sized automatically to match the height of this fraction. But there's nothing on the right of, or on the left of it, nothing that, that appears. And that's because it was contained on the left with a left period and closed on the right with a slash right vertical bar. Now, sometimes you want to do that sizing manually. And so there is a discrete set of different parentheses sizes that can be accessed using just the parentheses itself, that standard size, slash lowercase big, slash capital big, slash big with two Gs, slash capital big with two Gs. And that gives you a spectrum of different parentheses sizes that you can play with. Those don't have to be matched they can be applied to the different types of parentheses and delimiters though, as well. So you don't have to just do this with round parentheses. You could use curly braces, square brackets, so on. If you've done any work in linear algebra, you'll often want to create different types of matrices. And there are a few ways to do this. The simplest is the matrix environment. And it's a gridded delimited environment containing rows and columns. So it's opened. You've got to be inside of a math mode, so either inline or, or display math, or even inside of the align environment if you wanted to. Um, but inside of a math mode, you can create a matrix with the begin and end matrix statement. Each row, except for the last one, must be terminated with a carriage return, double slash. And each column within each row is going to be separated with a, 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 a tab stop, an ampersand. And you want to make sure that you've got the same number of columns on each row. Now, there's other types of matrix environments, P matrix, B matrix, V matrix, and so on. And what's, what's different with them is just that they get surrounded automatically by a parenthesis. So if you use the P matrix environment in place of the matrix environment, you'll automatically get some size parentheses around it. And this last option, I'm not going to go into and much depth right now you can go back to the wiki book and see this example of how to use it but there is, there are some limitations in terms of formatting with the different matrix environments and if you want more control you can take advantage of the array environment and then just wrap it in whatever kind of um, whatever kind of parentheses that you want one good example or one one good application of this is if you're creating an augmented matrix or a block matrix that's got vertical and horizontal separators in it. That's not so convenient to do in the matrix environments, but it's possible to do it in the array environment. Now there's various math fonts that you can take advantage of inside of any math mode. And you can just see a selection of them here and what they look like. 
some of them, well, this is just the normal math mode here. It's an italicized Roman notation. Um, there's math RM gives you a unitalicized Roman. Use that sometime if you're defining your own mathematical operators. Uh, the italicized version is just a little bit um, more slanted and, and uh, uh, serifed than the ordinary normal math environment. There's a bold environment. There's a sans serif environment. There's a true type, kind of like a typewriter font environment. This gothic looking fractur um, font, calligraphic font. This blackboard bold font is often used to represent number sets like the integers or the real numbers in this script font. So these are just a selection of commonly used fonts in mathematical and scientific writing. Sometimes you'll want to apply accents to your mathematical symbols. These can be things like carrots and dots overhead or arrows. Um, so here's a, a summary of, of, of those. And that's, that's really about it that I'm going to point out in this, this document. You know, you can go back to the sample document that created a few different math modes that we were just looking at. You can go into each of those different math modes and then work in conjunction with this chapter on mathematics and law tech and go through and try to maybe reproduce some of the examples through cutting and pasting. You can modify some of them. And the whole goal will be just to gain some familiarity with the different types of notation that you can represent in a LaTeX document. Another good way to get better at this is to have an actual project in mind. You might have something that you want to write about that involves some mathematical notation. And so a good challenge is to maybe write it out on paper first and then go through the wiki book and try to find the different tools that you need to represent that notation, and then try to put it into the appropriate math mode in your document. So there is this additional chapter in the LaTeX wiki book on mathematics called Advanced Mathematics, and it's worth knowing that it's, it's there. One reason you might want to delve into this chapter, it's not a very advanced reason, just a useful one, is that this is where you can go and learn about how to vertically align, learn more about how to vertically align equations and stack them using things like the align environment. So this section two here has quite a bit of detail on that. And if just the basic example that we looked at with an align isn't enough for you, then there's some more advanced examples here that you can work with. And so just be aware that that's there in the advanced mathematics chapter. Final topic of our tutorial has to do with creating theorems and theorem-like environments in your LaTeX documents. It's often useful to be able to render theorems, lemmas, corollaries, proofs, definitions, and other similar structures in a consistent way in your document. The AMS theorem package provides functionality for doing this, but it does take some setup. First of all, you'll have to load the AMS theorem package in the preamble of your document. Each theorem-like environment you plan to use has to be declared in the preamble with the new theorem command. This takes two inputs. <clears throat> the new theorem command takes two inputs, the name and the printed identifier. So if you wanted to be able to use a theorem environment, you would declare it using the following declaration in the preamble. New theorem of lowercase theorem is the name of the environment that you're going to use. And capital theorem is going to be the identifier that appears in your formatted document. This is going to allow you to create a formatted and numbered theorem in your text using the begin theorem and end theorem delimiters. And those are what you'll use to declare the theorem environment in the body of your document. After theorems or lemmas or corollaries or any other environment that might require proofs, you can add a proof environment. And this is open and closed using a begin proof and end proof statement. And it just is a way of attaching a proof to uh, a statement of a theorem or a lemma or a corollary. We're going to explore how all of these structures get used in detail by moving back over to our TechMaker editor and 
and look through a sample document. So this is our sample document for creating theorem-like environments in a LaTeX document. It begins just like any other LaTeX document with a document class statement. We're still just working within the article class. I've loaded the usual AMS packages, including AMS theorem, and now we finally see what that package is for. It allows us to have access to these theorem-like environments. So as we saw in the overview, we have to declare our theorem-like environments if we plan to use them in the document, and those declarations take place in the preamble. One thing that's worth being aware of is that theorem-like environments can be styled, meaning that they can have their own different different environments that serve different purposes can have their own look and feel. So conventionally, environments like theorems, lemmas, corollaries, axioms, things that usually represent a logical assertion that might or might not be proved, those are going to make use of the plain style. So the way that works in our preamble is that I have a block of new theorem declarations for each of those environments, but they're all preceded by a theorem style statement. And that theorem style statement uses plain as an input to indicate that these upcoming theorem declarations or theorem-like environment declarations are going to make use of that plain style. We can see all of these follow the convention. The theorem environment that we're creating first accepts the, you know, the name of the environment itself that we're going to declare later, on, or that we're going to open and close later on in our document, followed by the printed label that will appear in our formatted document, so capital theorem versus lowercase theorem. Same is true for lemmas, corollaries, and axioms. Now again, we could have called these environments anything that we wanted to, and we could have given them a, any printed identifier that we wanted to. So these are just matters of personal choice, but what you're looking at here is more or less the convention that you'll see in most documents. Now, another style that you might use for theorem-like environments is the definition style, and as its name suggests, that's useful for theorem-like environments such as definitions. You'll also see it used for um, like a, a solved example of a, of, a, of a math problem. So I've Got a new block of theorem like definition or theorem like declarations, beginning with theorem style definition to indicate that everything that follows will use that new definition style. And there's just two of them one for definition and one for examples. And then finally, there's a third style that's commonly used for theorem like environments in LaTeX, and it's the remark style. And you use that if you're going to make a tangential remark that you still want to stand out in your text. It will be labeled and numbered. Um, and so I'm using it to create a theorem-like environment called note. And so we can go look to the rest of the document, to the body of the document, to see how all of these are used. And um, see that I've got a bunch of new text here. We're starting with use of our plane environments. So the first thing that I use in terms of my plane theorem-like environments is an axiom environment. So it's, it begins with begin axiom, and it ends with end axiom. Everything between those two is going to be the statement of the axiom. And in this case, it's an axiom that is setting up the, the definition or the, you know, the defining characteristics of a, of a vector space. A lot of times with these theorem-like structures, you want to give them essentially a subtitle that goes along with their identifier. So what I want is this axiom to be labeled as axiom, maybe a number, and then in parentheses, I want it to say um, vector space because that's what the axiom is defining. So in other words, I want it to look something like this, axiom one, vector space, than all of the text. So all of the text is just ordinary LaTeX markup. Some of it has inline math. Some of it, um, uh, I don't know, there might be, it doesn't look like I used any display math environments. It's all, all inline in this axiom. So, you know, that, that's all that's, that's there. There's an example of a list, this enumerate environment, that I'm not really going to comment on much more here. We'll learn how to use those in more detail la later. But this is just a numbered list where 
we, we enumerate the, the different conditions that must be met if a mathematical structure is going to be a, a vector space in this case. So that, that's a pretty good example of what a plain uh, theorem-like environment looks like. It's going to be begin with the bold identifier label, uh, the optional title if you give it one, and then the text of that environment is all going to be italicized. That, that's what that style does. If we scroll through our document, I'll get a little bigger so we can see the rest of it. If we scroll through our document, we'll see that there's a few other plain style environments. There's a few definitions that I make, one for the column space, the row space, and the null space of a matrix. And then a, a lemma with a proof. So this is going to be a lemma about different matrix subspaces and the fact that they're uh, vector subspaces of, of uh, certain Euclidean spaces and Rn. Then finally, there's a theorem. Again, theorem, end theorem. It also has a proof, although I didn't bother to prove anything on either of these. I left the proofs as exercises to the reader just because I didn't want to type one. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll see the structure from this. So my theorem is for the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. Because like these other other structures, they're numbered environments, and sometimes you want to refer to them. I gave this one a label inside of the theorem environment and give it its proof. So we'll see what these look like. And once, once the document is compiled, we can see that our definitions, you know, those weren't plain environments. Those used the, the uh, definition style. So the big difference is, is that while the, the heading is bold, um, the text is not italicized, except for the math mode. But when we move back to the theorem and the lemma, those make use of the plain theorem style, so those are italicized, both of them, the, the, the lemma and the theorem. And then we can see the proofs after each of them. Those are not. Those are begun with a uh, italicized label of proof. The text of the proof itself is just ordinary Roman font. And then each proof ends with this QED symbol. In this case, it's just an open box. So that's put in there automatically by the proof environment to indicate that we're done reading the proof and we're going to move on to whatever's next in the document. So the only other environment that's in this document is this note environment that we declared. And it's one that makes use of the, the uh, remark theorem style. We can see that the remark theorem style is a little different. It's um, um, got a bold-faced title and non-italicized um, text in the body. And so that, that's really all that's there. So there's not much more to theorem-like environments, but one that's worth considering is that if you do want to learn more about making use of the theorem-like environments, there is a chapter, there is a section in the, in the LaTeX wiki book on theorems, and we're looking at it now on our browser. And it goes over much of what we've already seen. It does give you a little bit more information about how you can adjust the counters if you want to do something, um, do some custom referencing to your theorems, your axioms, your other theorem-like environments. Um, and, you know, just a review of the different theorem styles as well. So that, that's all there if you care to, to work with it. And that finally brings us to the end of our second tutorial on LaTeX and formatting mathematical notation. And hope you found it helpful and that you'll be able to join us for the upcoming tutorials.